His name was Jimmy. He was in my first period seventh grade social studies class in my very first year of teaching. He sat on the front row about right there. Now, Jimmy was a cowboy. I was teaching in Oklahoma, and he wore cowboy boots, and every day he wore a big silver and gold belt buckle. And he would look at me out of the corner of his eyes as he leaned back in his chair, and everything about Jimmy communicated that he had absolutely no use for me, and he was set out to make my life miserable. Now, one day, he looked at me and he said, Miss, are you married? Now, Jimmy had no way of knowing that I had recently broken off my engagement and I was not dealing with it very well. So, in front of the class, I said, No, I'm not. Jimmy flipped his head back and he said, It figures. Oh, how could a seventh grade boy wound me so? Oh, what pain. But that moment, I realized that all the training I had in college to create well-thought-out lessons that would challenge my students to solve problems and to think critically were completely useless if I could not figure out how to build a relationship with Jimmy. He needed to know that I cared for him and that he could trust me. So I set out to win him over. I started by praying for Jimmy. And then I went out of my way to talk to him about things that I knew that he was interested in. And slowly, over time, Jimmy and I became friends. Only then could I teach him my history curriculum. You see, love was essential. It was an essential component in the teaching and learning process. I'm betting that each one of you have a Jimmy somewhere in your past, someone that you've really needed to teach a life lesson, but you were not able to until you showed them that you cared for them. I'd love to sit down with you and hear your stories about how you broke through and got your Jimmy to trust you. I'm sure it involved letting them know that in some way you loved them. When people know that you love them, your ability to reach them increases exponentially. This is not only true for us individually, but is also true for our church. If our desire to help is if our desire is to help others come to know Jesus and to love them like we do, we have to recognize that love is a much better approach than getting into an argument with them or worse, shaming them or belittling them. This is one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul made the recurring love made love the recurring theme in his letter to the Gentile churches. In fact, he wanted them to know that love must be the distinguishing characteristic of the Christian church. It was essential. In today's language, love could be considered the brand for a church. A product's brand is a promise to their customer. I mean, it lets you know the customer, what you can expect from their product or their services. It differentiates their product from their competitors. The church's brand, according to Paul, has to be love. So let's ask the question. When people think of Georgetown Church of the Nazarene, what is the first thing they think of? What does the customer know they can expect when they attend our church. Now, before you answer that question, I want us to look at what Paul would say is the correct answer, and that would be love. Now, Paul wrote 
the book of Corinthians, about two, two and a half years after he left Corinth. He had actually lived in Corinth for about, um, for about 18 months. But he had gotten word that the church was struggling. And he wanted to remind them that their value system as a church, as a Christian fellowship, should not mirror the values of the surrounding culture. Instead, he wanted to establish that Christ crucified was the pattern for reevaluating all things in the culture. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is probably one of the most recognized passages in the Bible. Even if you're not a Christian, you probably can quote some of the lines in this passage. So in order to look at it from a fresh perspective, I'm using a translation that I bet none of you have ever read from, because it's new. It's called The Voice. This translation is kind of written like a, to read like a story. Now, I'm going to begin reading um, from 1 Corinthians 12, 31, because it's kind of a bridge between chapter 12 and chapter 13. So if you don't mind standing with me as I read God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. Pursue the greater gifts, and let me tell you of a more excellent way, love. What if I speak in the most elegant languages of people, or in the exotic languages of the heavenly messengers, but I live without love? Well then, anything that I say is like the clanging of brass or a clashing cymbal. What if I have the gift of prophecy and blessed with knowledge and insight to all the mysteries? Or what if my faith is so strong, it's strong enough to scoop up a mountain from its bedrock? Yet I live without love. If so, I am nothing. What if I could give all that I have to feed the poor? I could surrender my body to be burned as a martyr. But if I do not live in love, I gain nothing by my selfless acts. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is envious. It doesn't boast, brag, or strut about. There's no arrogance in love. It's never rude, crude, or indecent. It's not self-absorbed. Love isn't easily upset. Love doesn't tally wrong or, or celebrate injustice. But truth, ah, yes, truth, it's love's delight. Love puts up with everything and anything that comes along. It trusts, hopes, and endures no matter what. Love will never become obsolete. Now, as for the prophetic gifts, they will not last. Unknown languages will become silent, and the gift of knowledge will no longer be needed. Gifts, and, gifts of knowledge and prophecy are partial at best, at least for now. But when the perfection and fullness of God's kingdom arrive, all the parts will end. When I was a child, I spoke, thought, and reasoned in childlike ways. I mean, we all do. But when I became a man, I left my childish ways behind. For now, we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things as when we stare in polished metal. I realize that everything I know is only part of the big picture. But one day, when Jesus arrives, we will see clearly face to face, in that day, I will fully know, just as I have been wholly known by God. But now, faith, hope, and love remain. These three virtues must characterize our lives. The greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul explained the importance of each of the spiritual gifts. He wanted the Corinthians to know that all the gifts were important and that each one should be treated as such. You see, Paul had heard about divisions in the church, and one of the ways the people had begun to divide themselves by was to, by which spiritual gift that they had. 
and they began to promote their spiritual gift as the most important, and therefore they were the most important. And he wanted to turn their attention now, after he talked about the spiritual gifts in chapter 12, and he wanted to elaborate what in what we now call chapter 13, he wanted to elaborate where the Corinthians should place their focus. It wasn't on spiritual gifts. You see, Paul knew that spiritual gifts would someday fade away, but the gift of love was eternal. Paul begins by making the case that love is essential because it makes life's gifts profitable. Now, in verses 1 through 3, he argues that if you want your words to be heard and have any impact, you have to say them from a position of love. If you don't, well, they just sound like an irritating noise. You know that kind that you used to hate when you were in school and somebody would put their fingernails on the chalkboard? Oh, it's that kind of noise. Instead of winning the argument, we're actually losing ground. The person that we tried to win over now has completely tuned us out. We see this play out in many different ways in today's chaotic world. People in lots of different places and in lots of different ways are offering up their opinions using often colorful language. But instead of it having any impact on the way others think or believe, people are actually, just like I said, tuning them out. Why? It's because their words are not set out of love for anyone. In fact, it's meant to actually shame or belittle the hearer. Instead of changing their mind, they just scroll past the comment or hit delete. Love is essential if the goal of your speech, your wisdom, your intellect is to positively impact someone, especially if you're trying to persuade them of a spiritual truth. Now, in verses 4 through 7, Paul makes the case that love is essential because it makes life's relationships beautiful. I mean, we all know this. Relationships function best when love governs our actions. When I was studying these four verses, however, I, I noticed that love was the subject of the action. Love, the subject, is kind. Love, the subject, is patient. Love, the subject, is not jealous. Love, in every one of these phrases, is the subject of the action. And I kept wondering, why didn't Paul make love the verb? After all, Shouldn't, we be, shouldn't our love be visible throughout our actions? And then all of a sudden, it hit me. You could take the word love out of each one of those statements, and you could put Christ's name, Jesus, in there as the subject. And each of these proclamations would remain true. Take a look at it. As you can see, Jesus is synonymous with love. With Jesus as a subject, it helps us to see he is the example we are to follow. His sacrificial love on the cross, asking God to forgive those who have caused him harm. He is the example. His actions were always motivated by that sacrificial love. In everything he did, Jesus was kind. He was patient. He was long-suffering. And he always celebrated the truth. When our actions match Christ's actions, our relationships are naturally beautiful because our motivation is derived from by our love. Now to finish the chapter in verses 8 through 13, Paul makes it clear that 
Love is essential because it makes life's contributions eternal. These five verses argue that all of our spiritual gifts are going to fade away, except love never fails. It also reminds us that today we have a very distorted view of reality. He described it as looking in a mirror dimly. At that time, they didn't have mirrors like we do now. Instead, they had um, sheets of metal that they would make flat, and then they would polish it really good so that the person could at least see something of what they look like. But the result was anything but accurate. It was only a partial view. And Paul is telling us here that what we understand about reality today is incomplete. And worse, it's contaminated by our culture. Since we probably don't have the full story, love has to guide our words and our actions. When love propels us to act, our actions have eternal consequences. And isn't that our goal? Paul ends this chapter by reminding the Corinthians that they should ab abide in faith, hope, and love. But he went on to claim that the greatest of these is love. What Paul is doing is he's urging us that all Christian gifts, all spiritual gifts are important. But each of these gifts need love to have any Christian value. Love is essential in our personal walk with Christ, but, is all, but it is the most essential characteristic of a church. Therefore, our brand, the defining characteristic of our church, must be love. So the big question is, how do we do that? I mean, this seems impossible, right? I mean, you can't will yourself to love others. Now, you can will yourself to do good things, but loving someone as Christ loves us is truly a spiritual gift that's given to us by the Spirit of Christ. But there are a couple of things that we can do to work with the Spirit to motivate us naturally to love others. Some of you may remember a book that we read together several years ago called Surprise the World by Michael Frost. Remember, he taught us the five habits of highly missional people. Now, in this book, there are at least two of these habits that I think can help us kind of make sure that we're giving our best shot at loving other people, allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us. Two of these habits will help us do that. The first one's easy. You are to spend 30 minutes each week reading stories from one of the four Gospels. You see, as you saturate yourself in the stories of Christ, you become aware of the standard. I mean, what love looks like, how love responds in different life situations. Over time, the Spirit will use God's Word to conform your heart to his heart and your love for others will become more and more prevalent. The second of these five habits that I think will help activate our love for others is words um, for us to bless three people each week. Now, Frost suggested that these blessings could be in the form of words of affirmation, acts of kindness, or gifts. Remember? Words of affirmation can be a simple statement that you communicate in encouragement. You can do this even in the midst of this pandemic. This, these can be sent via a phone call or a text or through a note that you send to them in the mail. Now, acts of kindness, Frost suggests, are actions that you take to help someone, like maybe mowing their lawn or 
making them a, making them a mask or taking them a meal. Gifts, they come in all shapes and sizes. Think about what type of gift the individual needs at this particular time. These don't have to be extravagant or costly. The purpose is to get us to tangibly show our love for others. As you spend time reading about the life of Christ and spend time blessing others, your ability to love like Jesus will become more and more natural. Your, tra your training, your thought patterns, as well as your heart. Now, this is my challenge for you this week. Just this week, I'm asking every one of you to spend 30 minutes this week reading from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And then I'm asking you to bless three people. So this afternoon, while it's still fresh in your mind, get out a piece of paper. Jot down when you'll take that 30 minutes to read stories about Christ in one of the Gospels. And then think about who you'd like to bless. Write their names down on the piece of paper. Then I'm going to ask you to pray for them and ask God, how can I bless them? Now, I'm only asking you to do it this week. You can do it for one week. My hope is that you'll rather enjoy it and you'll do it another week. But right now, I'm just asking for one week. Earlier, I asked you what you think others thought about our church. Is love the distinguishing feature of our fellowship? The answer to that question depends on how seriously each of us takes Paul's admonition that we are to love as Christ did. So in closing, I want to urge you to pray that God would enable us to love as described in 1 Corinthians 13. This type of church can change the world. This was true for the church in Corinth, and it's true for the church in Georgetown. As we watch our world almost seem to implode before our very eyes, remember, the world doesn't need more anger or vitriol. No, 1 Corinthians 13 is teaching us that love must govern how we navigate through these perplexing times and that the church must be, the church must be the example of this more excellent way. So I'd like to offer a benediction. So if you will open your hands, we do this in Georgetown Church of the Nazarene. It's a way of signifying that what we've heard today, we're open to the Spirit speaking to us and communicating to us what we can learn from it. Today's benediction is going to be a prayer, a prayer for our church. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for your son's sacrificial love. Your love for us was expressed through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We ask that you search our hearts and point out ways in which we fall short of Christ's example. Give us a supernatural desire to seek the welfare of others. Change our hearts to love as you love. You are the only one that can do that in our lives. It requires a supernatural act on your part. Spirit, move in each one of us. Help our church to be known as the church that loves deeply and sacrificially. Help it to be what distinguishes us from our culture. Use our love for others to draw them to you. In your name we pray. Amen.